Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. And I'm Randy Mason. Welcome to The Local Show, where we showcase the many things Kansas City has to offer, from arts and culture to developments in education, health care, and life sciences. This week, we start with something elemental, genomes. They're the mechanism by which our bodies operate. They contain all the genetic information that makes us who we are. Ten years ago this month, scientists completed work on the Human Genome Project. And since then, the technology to explore it further has rapidly evolved. Last year, Time Magazine noted the genomic work being done at Kansas City's Children's Mercy Hospital to dramatically speed up the diagnosis and treatment of critically ill infants. Think of it as the difference between testing a patient one disease at a time versus the much broader net that genomes allow us to cast. It's an innovative example of how translational research can ultimately enhance patient care. It's all too common. A child wakes up presenting symptoms a parent has never seen before. At the same time, hundreds of illnesses pass from one generation to the next. Genetic diseases that even the most determined doctor can't pin down. But inside Children's Mercy Hospital, a small team of medical specialists are dedicating themselves to decoding the code of human life. They're part of the Pediatric Genomic Medicine Center, a one-of-a-kind research facility established two years ago that's rapidly redefining hundreds of years of pediatric care. And that machine loads it onto this. This actually has wells. The catalyst for it all is Dr. Stephen Kingsmore. The type of diseases we're looking at may affect 20 or 30 percent of the babies in our intensive care unit. But then they also affect one or two percent of children, about half a million patient visits a year. There are a tremendous number of children who have diseases that we think we can make a difference for. Make, make a muscle for me? One of the center's first patients is seven-year-old Ryan. Let me have you hold, you hold your leg out like this. Don't let it fall. Ready? Keep it up there. He was born completely floppy, didn't have um, a lot of the reflexes a lot of other babies have. It's just generalized muscle weakness. Early on, Ryan's doctors suspected something genetic because the mysterious symptoms were recurring in two of his three sisters. But where to start? Hundreds of genes can cause hypotonia. So an invasive muscle biopsy, a process his mother had hoped to avoid, seemed like the only hope for a diagnosis. They just did everything slower, but because they did eventually hit those milestones, there was no reason to poke and prod on them. Also, Sherry feared what an answer might hold. Might they find something she'd prefer not to know? Would a label stigmatize her kids? Finally, the desire for knowledge won out. About a year and a half ago, I went to my family doctor and I said, I need to know what this is, what their future holds. I need to know what to tell them, you know, when my son gets in high school and if he wants to play football and he doesn't have the muscle strength or it's not safe. Courtney, when she wanted to have kids, that, hey, is this gonna affect your children? If not for the Genome Center, Sherry might still be fishing for answers, paying for costly test after test. But the scientists and specialists who've teamed up at Children's Mercy are literally shifting the way that medicine is practiced. Mapping a patient's genes first, then matching specific symptoms to them. Dr. Sarah Soden is in charge of connecting the center with families like Sherry's, weary of getting more questions than answers. Give this mom a call. She had questions about Danielle's medication. Sure, she These families are trying to meet the day-to-day -day needs of their kids. They're trying to remember what doctors are saying to them. They're trying to remember even what tests have been run, what tests were run when they lived in a different state. Some have been tested for more than 10 years, 15 years. All of that is very difficult on families. If we can make the diagnosis using advanced technologies in the very beginning, while they're still engaged in the process, it can really make a difference in letting them just focus on their child and moving forward. Two-year-old Patrick is another of the center's patients. His red blood cells aren't functioning as they should. Since birth, He's dependent upon monthly transfusions to stay alive. And then how did he do after the biopsy? Doctors suspected a rare form of anemia, okay. but had no way to confirm. 
until Dr. Kingsmore's team took his blood sample, tested it, and delivered a diagnosis in just four weeks. Congenital dysurethropoietic anemia. And only not many people have it, right? Yeah, from what I've, what she told me, it's um, 300 cases reported in the world. For Patrick, there is a cure, a bone marrow transplant. But prepping his body for surgery is an arduous and exhausting process. Returning week after week for infusions takes its toll. He's been through so much since he was born, and we don't want to keep adding more and more stuff. I don't really want to do the, I feel like I have to do it, but I don't really want to. I know. Well. In Patrick's case, hematology and genomics will continue working in tandem to monitor his body's response to the medicine, all part of a collaborative treatment approach that Dr. Kingsmore has emphasized all along. We wanted that to be a um, close linkage so that really this was an extension of the hospital's capabilities as opposed to often a research site somewhere detached from the hospital. Those capabilities include some amazing state-of-the-art machines that can decode genomes at record speeds. It took a decade to unravel the first genome. This super high-speed sequencer can do it in 24 hours. They've named it Marlin and its companion Nemo. A little lab humor to soften what still seems a harsh reality. Not every child will get an answer. The center's diagnostic rate is close to 33%, still higher than other genome centers. Clinical director Carol Saunders strives to be conservative with each analysis, only terming diagnostic those samples she's certain about, like Patrick's. Chromosome 20, we've got two variants in the same gene. It's SEC23B, associated with a very specific type of anemia called congenital dyserythropoietic anemia, type 2. In the analysis process, we sort by frequency to get rid of all the common stuff in order to try to prioritize what we're looking at. The bioinformatics software that Carol uses has been developed by teammate Neil Miller. Okay, so load the, the DX1 report definition. The data is so large that you need computational tools to handle it. This is the patient sequence here, and then we have, um, we have the mothers and the, and the fathers lined up as well to compare child comes in, he's sick with a certain number of symptoms. We have a system that lets you figure out what genes might be most important to look at for those symptoms. And then we have another set of software that tells you um, whether that child's genes um, look like they have mutations in them that might be disease causing. One of the things that we've done that is somewhat different than anybody else in the country is to only allow our computers and our analysis to focus on things which are immediately relevant to a child's uh, symptoms or disease. And so we are blinding ourselves to 99.9% .9 of the other stuff. And that's really different and that protects us a lot from all of that information that probably you didn't want to know about yourself or about your child. Yeah. So you... in every lab, we've got a pre and post PCR separation. Hmm. So that, uh, Researchers and physicians are starting to seek out Dr. Kingsmore's team, as are families from as far away as Turkey and India who want their samples run. Already, more than 250 have enrolled in the center's research program. Later this year, the hospital plans to roll out a focused clinical test available to all children who've been admitted. It screens for 514 genes, from cystic fibrosis to neurologic conditions, at the same price it would cost to test for two. Like most two-year-olds, Patrick's always on the move. Soon he'll be headed home, continuing treatment so his body will be ready for major surgery in as little as eight weeks. Thank you, Mama. You're welcome. While the Genome Center has enabled him to walk away with a timely diagnosis, some caution that technology like this, which can reveal so much, may not always be in a child's best interest. What John Morris calls unleashed genetic information is a point of discussion in places like his Rockhurst classroom. Morris is a philosophy professor who teaches medical ethics. 
uh, but there are facts we'll want to take. You have to be very careful about these tests with children. When, it, when you've got an infant and you see a marker that they've got, uh, you know, one of these single cell genetic diseases, that doesn't tell me how it's going to present that child. It doesn't tell me how sick my child will, will be or how my child might be able to adapt. My gunshot wound, what do you think would be like major complications? Genetics can be viewed as a limitation, and I think that's the danger, and that's what I mean by unleashed. Information has to be understood. Information by itself is just data, and it doesn't tell me anything. We combine those two, and so we have that symptom there. So we have these three symptoms now that we've chosen. The key, Neil Miller says, is education for doctors and health service providers who will be charged with implementing tests that didn't even exist just a few years ago. Within the hospital, we're trying to spend a lot of time, and software plays a big, big part of that, and how do we you know, create tools that are easy to use and meaningful that give the physicians what they want, um, but in some senses only what they want. We don't want to flood them with, with too much information. And I'm going to close them tight and I'm going to try and open them. Can you keep them closed? Good job. I'm a young physician in medicine. I should be, you know, one ready for how it affects my practice, but, you know, even I've been caught off guard by um, uh, how powerful this tool is um, and how challenging it can be to interpret as it's pushing these frontiers of diagnosis and testing and um, typical algorithms that, you know, even I, I learned just a few years ago that are being turned upside down. Genomic medicine can be seen as a peek into the diseases and conditions we may have to confront. At Children's Mercy Hospital, it's an open door to more personalized medicine. For Sherry Allred, it was simply the answer she'd been waiting 10 years to hear. Nemeline myopathy, I will never forget the phone call. The first thing she told me was it's not life-threatening. It, I mean, it changed my life right there, just knowing that they were gonna be okay. Ready? Just to watch them run and jump and play, it lets me know that, yeah, even though they, you know, they might have this disorder, it's, it won't define who they are. You know, they can define who they're gonna be, and I think they're gonna, I think they're gonna be awesome. I think they have a, a, a huge life ahead of them, all of them. Media attention from the likes of Time Magazine and the News Hour is nice for Dr. Kingsmore and his team, but even nicer was the recent $1 million grant from the William T. Kemper Foundation to help fund the Genomic Center's activities.